Hey everybody, and welcome to the third and final discussion video on Xenogears. After this, I'm going to move straight on to writing the review. So if you have anything that you want to add to this uh, conversation here, put it in the comments. I'll read it and, and consider it as I begin basically forming my final opinions on the game and moving forward with the review. So the way I'm going to handle this today is I have a lot of sources I'm going to be going over. Um, Let's see, I can pull it up here. A bunch of tabs. Uh, here's, I'll, I'll get into some of your comments at the end, so I'm going to respond directly to some of your comments, but uh, a bunch of different uh, resources here, uh, inspirations for the game and things like that that we'll be going over. But before we do that, I actually first want to do more or less a summary of of this the whole story surrounding Xenogears and the reason I'm doing this is not to explain it to you because I'm sure many of you already know this stuff but rather I want to try to make sure it's I've, I've got a solid idea of what the story is in my head um, and if there's anything important that I'm missing from this feel free to point it out in the comments just to make sure that um, there's nothing really big in, in the in the picture and in, in the puzzle that I'm missing that's giving me a kind of a wrong idea about what the story is all about. So I've read perfect works. Um, I've read a bunch of the um, the different resources you guys gave me for different people's like analyses of the story. Um, I've read up a lot and so after doing all of that this is the final understanding I've come to I guess. There are six episodes in Xenogears. Um, the game itself, the story that's told in the game, is episode 5 out of 6. So, there's a lot there. A lot of stuff, basically, that comes before the events of Xenogears that is pretty important to understand if you really want to get a good grasp of what's happening in the events of the game. Episode 6 has not been defined. It was never really, like told or even given in an interview or there's no I no ideas no real good uh, explanation at all for what episode 6 was meant to be it's a it's a total mystery there we know episode 5 because that's the course of the game but a lot of what happened before that while some of that is glimpsed in the game with, with some flashbacks and scenes um, you can't really get an entire grasp of it without reading perfect works um, and so, thank you for everyone who gave me links to an English translation of that. I really appreciate it. Um, so, in episode one, it kind of starts actually a little bit in our past. It starts in 2001 when humans discover the Zohar. Now, this, I believe, is added. Uh, if you, if you, are going basically just on the text in the game for story. Um, the way of existence explains that the Zohar was created by humans, you know, in the past. Basically, you know, probably in our future, but way in the past of when this game occurs. Um, but in in the uh, in the perfect works, it seems that he wanted to sort of change the story a bit. He had some different ideas of where he wanted to go. The story was continually evolving even throughout the course of making it um, and he was he was wanting to change things by he I mean the director uh, Takahashi who wrote the story as well with his wife um, anyways so he changed it in perfect works to where humans discover the Zohar which is as old as the universe basically um, and this is a very clear reference to the monolith in 2001 a space odyssey um, but in, in any case, humans discover it. They don't really have the technology or the knowledge to know how to use it yet, so it's, you know, set aside for a time, so to speak. In 2500 AD, humans begin colonizing uh, the cosmos. They, they, they send arcs, they send ships out to look for other habitable planets, and eventually the Earth is totally abandoned, which is named Lost Jerusalem. Lost Jerusalem is the Earth where mankind's origins were. They find a new planet called Neo-Jerusalem, um, and from there they kind of then branch out and start colonizing the entire galaxy. Um, by the time we get to 4600 AD, so a couple thousand years in the future, uh, there begins to be a war, a galactic war, 
a, a huge war. Uh, it's not like specified like what they're fighting about or uh, how many factions or, or groups of people are fighting each other, but there's a galactic war. During this time, a supercomputer called the Catamony is created, and it has the ability to create artificial life. Basically, indistinguishable from other humans. So they have they have a consciousness that the catamony puts into them, but it's not like a robot artificial intelligence, right? It's a biological artificial intelligence. Um, then they create Deus, and Deus is a sentient computer. So this is not, well, it's part biological and part uh, mechanical. Um, but the, but Deus is a sentient computer that is created from at least partly biological parts. So, um, and it is a weapon created and powered, not created by, but powered by the Zohar. So they, they've brought the Zohar back out that they discovered and they discover its sort of infinite um, energy potential. It has this incredible energy output that they can harness and they can power uh, this computer Deus as a weapon and the destruction that it unleashes is completely catastrophic just unbelievably powerful to the point where humanity then decides this thing needs to be decommissioned it's it's sentient it's very very intelligent and it's out of control out of our control and it could wipe out our entire race so they decide to decommission it, and that's where the events of the very first cutscene come into play. The very first cutscene of the game where that ship is flying and, and then it, it's being destroyed from the inside, it's being sort of like hacked, so to speak. That's what they were doing. The Eldridge, that ship, was taking Deus to a place where it was going to be locked away and decommissioned. Just before that happened, before um, basically Deus unleashed all of its chaos um, the the Zohar which was powering it so not Deus itself but Zohar which was its power source trapped the wave existence inside of it and the wave existence is um, a higher dimensional being we're four dimensional beings uh, we live in a four dimensional universe so the wave existence which is a higher dimensional being um, is trapped inside of the Zohar uh, and can't can't escape it. So while uh, the ship is en route to decommission Deus, uh, there's a boy aboard who's a refugee of the war. His name is Abel, and he comes in contact with the Zohar. He touches the Zohar, and by so doing, makes contact with the wave existence itself. This boy learns that there is a being trapped inside of this that is trying to get out. And he becomes, from that point, Abel, the boy, becomes the contact, which is this person who is able to communicate through the Zohar to the wave existence directly. And the wave existence asks, or, or basically gives him a, a mission to help set the wave existence free. Um, in order to accompany the boy, who did not have parents, his parents had been killed, he was an orphan, the wave existence created a companion from using the catamony. Remember, the catamony can create artificial life. The wave existence created a, an artificial life um, called, uh, and I, I never can pronounce her name correctly, but I think it's Eliheim. Elheim, Elheim, maybe El Elheim. Anyways, it's Ellie. <laughs> uh, creates Elheim to accompany or to help or to. Uh, be a partner to Abel in helping to free the wave existence from the Zohar. Um, again, artificial life, we're talking about basically indistinguishable from humans. They're organic, just like we are, but they're just um, genetically created from the catamony. Does that make sense? Uh, then the attack happens. Uh, Deus uh, basically fights back against the Eldridge. The captain has to set a self-destruct sequence to stop it and the Eldridge uh, crash lands on this new planet. Um, just before the Eldridge goes into the ocean and Deus is, uh, you know, 
trapped underneath the ocean there on the ocean floor. He basically, or I say he, it, Deus, the computer, um, is able to eject the Catamony and the Zohar from the ship so that it lands on the surface. And uh, also has a being created called Miang. And Miang is an artificial life form like Ellie is. But Miang is given the task of helping to repair Deus so that it can... It basically goes into this this uh, maybe hibernation mode, you can call it, where it tries to repair itself from this destruction, this explosion, and Miang is tasked with providing the means to do that. Okay? So, in order to do that, Deos has to take a very, very long time to repair itself. It's very damaged, but it needs biological parts. Well, both biological and mechanical, but the important part to focus on is it needs biological parts. And so, what Miang is sent out to do is to give birth to a new humanity, basically. To be the mother of a new humanity that are sacrificed and given to Deos the parts, the organic parts, so that it can repair itself. Um, and so she gives birth to Cain and the Gazelle Ministry, who are going to be these humans that help her accomplish that. Uh, they're going to be tasked as sort of being the overlords to to watch over humanity, to raise it up, and then prepare it for sacrifice so that all of these people can be uh, basically taken in by Deos, used as organic parts so that it can heal itself and then return to the cosmos. Now, Deos mission, as far as we understand it, is just to find lost Jerusalem. That's that's what it wants. It wants to go back to the original Earth. So on top of repairing itself, from there it wants to go back to Earth again. Okay, so that more or less ends episode one. Then we move on to episode two. Abel, the boy from the Eldridge, survived this crash. He was the only one who survived. He's the only, like, genuine human being uh, on this new planet that wasn't created from the Catamony and then Miang, basically. Um, and when Abel finds out what Cain and the Gazal Ministry are doing, essentially raising human sacrifices for Deus, he wants to fight against that. So he and Ellie, uh, they're paired together and they resist. Um, there's not a whole lot that's described or known about what form that resistance took, but we do know that Cain uh, eventually killed Abel and, uh, and Ellie as well, um, and continued on with their plan. Now, over time, this weighed on Cain. He felt guilty for doing this. And um, that kind of leads to his eventual sort of mindset in the course of the game, where he's not really on the Gazal Ministry's side. Um, and he's not necessarily want. well, he, we know for sure he doesn't want to sacrifice humanity anymore. And he and, um, Sitan, or Saitan, I, I think it's Sitan, but I like Saitan better. <laughs> he and Sitan are working together to sort of, like, prevent that from happening. Uh, basically, the wave existence through the Zohar reincarnates the souls, the consciousness of Cain and Ellie over the, uh, the generations um, to continually try and resist this uh, plan that's been put in motion by Miang, uh, Deos, and, and the, uh, the Gazelle Ministry, and Cain, to resist them and free itself from the Zohar. So, uh, so Kim is the reincarnated soul of Abel, and Ellie is still named, well, we don't, I'm not sure if we know exactly what her name is, but I think it's Ellie. But, um, they fall in love, they get married in this time period, and humanity reaches a really high sort of level of um, advancement in science and technology, but they've developed a genetic um, imperfection in that a lot of people are unable to procreate. There's a, a genetic deficiency. And because of this, Miang realizes that these are not going to be adequate sacrifices for Deus. So she sets in motion a plan to basically wipe out humanity, like blank slate again, start over because of this genetic deficiency. Um, 
And Kim, however, was in the process of working on nanotechnology, which would basically fix this deficiency in the human genome that had developed. Well, on top of being able to, to fix that genetic deficiency, he could create uh, artificial life from basically just nano tech, not these nano machines. Create a uh, nano machine, what do they call it in the game? There's a term for it. Um, colony? A, a nano machine colony, I think is what they call it, which is where just a bunch of nano machines sort of make up a person. Hold on, I think I misspoke earlier, so I need to go back and correct that. Episode 1 is leading up to the crash, right? Episode 2 is Abel and Ellie and um, and Kane's story that we don't know a lot about. Episode 3 is where Kim comes in, right? So Kim is studying nanotechnology, and he creates Emerelda. Uh, that's what Emerelda is, this nanomachine colony. Um, basically, right as they have that sort of success, that final success, um, the government steps in, or at least takes over his research, kills Kim and Ellie, and um, and then this uh, nuclear war is perpetuated by Miang, who takes the form of two different women. And that's something I need to explain as well. So Miang is not necessarily one person. She is um, a consciousness that can be reborn, like because of the way the genetic structuring has been uh, built by Deos when he created Miang. Um, any any woman, any woman, has the potential to be awakened as Miang. So any woman can become Miang. When, when Miang dies, her consciousness can be reawakened in any human woman on this planet. Anybody. So Miang actually awakens as two twin sisters during episode three and instigates this war that wipes out most of humanity, more than 90%, and kind of starts it over again. Um, after, you know, several thousand more years, you get to the point of episode four, which is 500 years before the course of the game, the events of the game itself. And this is where you get uh, Krellian and um, Lacan and Sophia, um, and, and that story. And that story is pretty well covered in the game, but um, basically the way it goes is that at this point, the Gazelle Ministry and um, and Cain believe that humanity is ready to be sacrificed to Deus. And by the way, we're getting pretty close to um, the limit of how long they can wait to do this. Uh, it's, it's not described super well or very much in depth in Perfect Works, but for some reason there is a 10,000 year time limit for Deus to repair itself. Uh, it must complete that process within 10,000 years. And by the time we're up to episode 4, we're at 9,500 years. So there's only 500 years left on that time limit. And this time limit and the repercussions of that time limit are what are referred to in the game as the time of the gospel. I know this is a lot of information, it seems very confusing, but just think of it this way. Basically, if Deus is not real, if Deus is not repaired within that 10,000 year time limit, then uh, it's over. It, it, it won't be able to repair itself at that point, it dies. And according to the philosophy of the Gazelle Ministry and Miang, humanity would also die. They, they could not continue to live without Deus. The reason for that, I don't know. I don't think it's explained anywhere. But, if Deus is not revived, they believe that humanity will die out as well. So their goal is to live on through becoming one with Deus, through sacrificing their organic parts to help repair Deus and living in him, so to speak, becoming one with God. They believe that's the only way to save humanity. That's their point of view on that. So. Whether or not humanity is supposed to die when Deus dies, I don't know. But that's what the time of the gospel is referring to in the game, if you were curious about that. Now, um, so we're getting up to that time limit. There's only 500 years left. And 
At this point, the Gazal Ministry is thinks that humanity is ready. Miang disagrees. She doesn't think that they're ready yet, so they're kind of at odds there. And that's one of the thing I, things I like about this game is that the villains are kind of, they disagree with each other, they're at odds with each other a lot of times. Like we said, um, Miang disagrees with the Gazal Ministry about humanity being ready, but they move forward with a plan to do this. And what they do is they create Solaris, which is this floating city, a city that goes up into the sky. They can kind of survey what's going on below and control from there. Um, one thing they start doing is they start abducting people and turning them into Welltals, which are like the mutated monster looking things. And then from there, they turn them into food. Uh, in the Soylent system. The Soylent system is a, a, a part of Solaris where they are basically turning people into food. Uh, so that's one thing that they're doing, it's kind of fetched up, but on top of that um, they create uh, an organization or a religion on the surface to sort of um, to sort of keep an eye on people, but their, their real purpose is to excavate ruins from the past civilization to get gears and technology uh, that can be used. So, they're, they're sort of keeping an eye on people. That's what the, the ethos, which is this religion, this organization that Solaris sets up, it's kind of their way of, of keeping people in check um, and preparing them to be sacrificed. Uh, there are some very important characters that come into the story at this time. We have Krellian, Lacan, Sophia, Roni, and Rene. So Krellian is very important because he, he sort of becomes the main villain of Xenogear is like the, the game, but um, he is an interesting character because he stumbles across the research of Kim, the, the guy who had been, the, the basically Lacan from this time who had been reincarnated, but the, the contact, Kim, uh, who had done all that research on nanomachines. Then we have Sophia, who is basically like the figurehead of the, the Nissan sect. Um, well, Nissan is a city, but they kind of have their own, like, religion there, and she sort of becomes the figurehead of that religion. Now, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is getting crazy. We're getting close to the end. Uh, Roni and Rene Fatima are the uh, ancestors, direct, directly descended from them, is going to be Bart. Um, and they found the kingdom of Av. I, I believe it's pronounced Av because it comes from... Uh, a Jewish word and Kislev is the same way but anyways they found Av. Kislev is uh, also founded in this time um, well actually just in the time after this but basically humanity figures out what Solaris is doing and at this point they've evolved the ability to use ether or basically magic so to speak and they begin fighting back um, there's also another set of people who create Shavat, and Shavat is obviously the other floating city in Xenogears, but they also oppose what Solaris is doing. So it's founded by people who have sort of dissented from Solaris, but also uh, some other people. And they basically declare war on Solaris, and they're going to stop them from doing what they're doing. And uh, so the, the lambs, or the surface dwellers, are allied and Nissan is sort of like their their headquarters, so to speak, and they are allied with Shavat, and they're fighting against Solaris. So while this war is going on, um, eventually, well, it's important to mention here that um, Lacan and Krellian, who are both heavily involved in this conflict, they're fighting with Nissan, they are both in love with Sophia, so they're kind of a little love triangle going on there. And um, essentially, the Gazal Ministry in Miang, because they're sort of opposed in their ideas at this time, they come up with a plot to get rid of Sophia, because she's a nuisance to their actions, to their plans here, by saying, we'll give you, and they're talking to Shavat, they make this deal with Shavat, we're going to give you um, Miang if you give us Sophia. And Shavat agrees to do this because they think Miang is sort of the spearhead of this whole movement, that she's the one that they need to take down, right? So they agree to do this, um, and basically Sophia ends up sacrificing herself in this sort of desperate kamikaze suicide attack on Solaris. And when Lacan and Krellian learn that Shavat had made this deal, 
um, they both sort of lose their minds. And then from that point, they both go from being the um, the protagonists of Episode 4 to the antagonists of Episode 5. And that takes the form of Krellian deciding that he, he he's so hurt that any god that he believed in, which was the you know, the religion of Nisan, the god that they had believed in there, would allow the, something like this to happen, that he decides he's going to make his own god, right? And he decides to go ahead and sympathize with what Solaris is trying to do. He decides he wants to become one with Deus, to, to basically um, transcend into uh, beyond what we as humans are and our limits and our imperfections become one with Deus and go back into the cosmos again. So he goes into Solaris and essentially works his way up to being the guy in charge of the whole place and uh, basically ends up fighting for what he was fighting against during episode 4. Uh, Lacan on the other hand goes and frees Miang from her prison on Shavat um, as a, a means of revenge against them I guess. And she sees, or she realizes that he is the contact, the, the reincarnated contact. And uh, sends him on a mission to find the Zohar to communicate with it. And he ends up finding the Zohar. And when he, when he does make contact, and there's, there's a part that doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense to me. But when he makes contact with the Zohar, Lacan, the consciousness that's been reincarnated, dies. For whatever reason and a new personality is born in Lacan's body which is Graf uh, and Graf gets this ability to jump from person to person um, eventually he as we know from the events of Xenogears takes over um, Faye's father's body and and so Faye's, Faye's father's personality sort of fights against graph inside of him similarly to how id fights for control over fey um but anyways he is the spearhead in miang's plan i'm saying graph is graph is the spearhead in miang's plan to basically wipe out humanity again and start over i don't know why she wants to do that but he he so what he ends up doing is he awakens what's called the diabolus core and uh they bring about the day of collapse they just like enormous destruction just take out everything this is where uh, the Gazal ministry are killed and um, Krellian is able to upload eight of their consciousnesses <laughs> I don't know the plural for that word into that computer that sphere computer where the Gazal ministry are stored only eight of them he's able to save but he uploads their consciousness into that computer um, but most of uh, but the other four are killed so these these people have been around since the very beginning so that's kind of a big deal but in any case, um, Krellian and Miang then sort of take over um, the, the, the plans that had been laid out from the beginning for the, the Gazelle Ministry and Kane and everybody like that. But that's where Krellian goes. Uh, Lakan dies when he makes contact and Graf is born and he wipes out everything and humanity starts over again, which leads up to the events of Episode 5, which are the events of the game. Um, where Faye is born, um, he witnesses some terrible things in his childhood. Again, I'm not going to go into the events of Episode 5. We know what happens there if you play the game. Okay, so, with all of that being said, <laughs> it's an extremely long explanation. It's very dense, lots of information, huge amount of background that needs to be understood to really understand what's going on in the game. And I find it to be fascinating. It's a fascinating concept. It's really, really cool lore and background, and I really like it. And having known this, the story of Xenogears becomes so much deeper and meaningful and impactful to me. I really love the story, um, especially when you understand that background. Now, uh, the few questions that are that remain with me after understanding all of this sort of the some of the what i feel are logical leaps or just things that aren't very well explained um things that i, I would like to have answers to if i could are first of all why does Miang want to restart humanity so many times like 
I get it during Kim's era, uh, where there's the genetic deficiency. Um, and so, like, oh, those aren't appropriate sacrifices. Let's wipe out and start over again and get rid of that genetic deficiency. But why does she want to wipe out humanity again at the end of episode four? Um, we're getting very close to the time limit. There's only 500 years left. There isn't any genetic deficiency there. She just feels like they're not quite, quite ready yet. Humanity's not quite ready yet. You can continue to develop them over the course of the next 500 years or so, up to the time limit, but why wipe them out then? I don't really understand why she wanted to do that, why she, she sent Lacan, who became Graf, out for that purpose. Um, killing off the Gazal Ministry, I could see. But why, I don't know, why she wants to wipe out humanity again, I don't understand. Um, also, and I've gone over this a little bit, but I don't totally understand this idea of the time of the gospel. Why is there a time limit for Deus? Why, if Deus dies, does humanity die? Like, all of that stuff, I, I, I've heard that it's more well explained in Xenosaga, that the idea is developed better in Xenosaga, and that I would have to play Xenosaga in order, in order to understand that. That it's a similar concept to, um, uh, I think it's called heat death, where, where the universe is expanding and cooling and eventually will die. That there's a, a sort of like cosmic time limit on that. Eventually, you know, the universe is going to expand, cool, and, and die. It's a similar sort of concept this time of the gospel, that without Deus, humanity dies. But uh, I don't know. If that's better explained in Xenosaga, in Xenosaga, then I guess I'll just find out there. But I wish that there were some resources to explain what's going on with that. And then my third question, big question, is why does Lacan die when he makes contact with the Zohar? Um, the only theory I can come up with is maybe the wave existence could see how poisoned he was by his pain of Sophia's death and his, his need for revenge. And that, that at that point when he saw that, he's like, okay, this person is not in a state of mind where... Um, he can he can do this for me. I'll, I'll kill him off and reincarnate him again and give him a new life and new experiences and hopefully it'll be better next time. Uh, aside from that, I can't really think of a good reason why Lacan would die. His consciousness would go out of the would leave the body and Graf would replace it. <clears throat> Don't really understand what, what's going on there. But aside from those few things, um, I think the story fits really well. Um, it's, it has a lot of really great ideas. It's very interesting, fascinating stuff, and I really, really like it. Okay, so let's let's move on to discussing some of the inspirations of Xenogears, and there's a lot. So just from uh, from science fiction, we have uh, Soylent Green, which was um, a film, a science fiction film, like a, a, th a thriller that was um, made in 1973. It came out in 1973. And the entire idea behind this movie was that uh, it, it takes place in New York City. There's a huge food shortage. Uh, people are starving. And um, Soylent Green is the name of the food that's produced by the government like, as rations for people. And um, if you don't want spoilers for this movie, just click forward a little bit if you plan on watching that, not knowing the big reveal. But in how this relates to Xenogears, uh, the main character discovers that Soylent Green is actually being made from people. Uh, they're, they're harvesting humans and turning them into food to feed the population. And so the really popular line from that is when Charleston Heston says, Soylent, Soylent Green is people, right? He's, he's like losing his mind, he's going crazy. He's talking about how Soylent Green, the food that they're eating, is made of people. And that's not just uh, an inspiration, that's a direct reference. That is a, a, a direct homage, homage. I never know how to pronounce that word. Is it homage or is it homage? Anyways, a direct homage to um, this movie right here. Um, with the Soylent system. It's even called Soylent. The Soylent system where they're making food out of wells in, uh, in Xenogears. So that's one really big inspiration there. Of course, we talked about the similarity with uh, the Zohar and the monolith. And it became more and more, especially as he developed the story post-release of the game, um, he, it became clear that he wanted the Zohar to basically be what the monolith is in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, 
a lot of Arthur C. Clarke's work inspired Xenogears. And I've read um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. If you haven't read the, the novel, it's really awesome. I like it way better than the movie. The movie's great too, but I like the, I like the book quite a bit more. Um, but uh, also, another one of Arthur C. Clarke's um, stories that heavily inspired Xenogears was Childhood's End. And Childhood's End uh, is basically where the, the character Krellian comes from. Uh, Krellian is, from what I understand, a misspelling of the name for the English localization of Xenogears. Um, he actually wanted the character to be named exactly what the character in this story is called, and his name is Karelin, uh, spelled there, as you can see. So that's that's another, not just a reference or, or an inspiration, that's a, that's a direct homage to this story. He took the name of this character and made it the same name as the character in his story he was developing. This is Takahashi I'm talking about. And essentially in this story, again if you don't want spoilers, skip ahead a little bit. In this story, Karelin and some alien overlords are essentially watching over humanity in sort of the same way that the Gazal Ministry is doing. Um, and preparing them to be sacrificed to the Overmind, which is like a, a godlike intelligence, a cosmic intelligence. Um, so a lot of this is, again, directly, directly taken into Xenogears, but comes from this book, Childhood's End, by Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke's a great author, by the way. I've read, uh, like I said, 2001 A Space Odyssey, but also Rendezvous with Rama. You guys should read his stuff, it's awesome. But I really want to read Childhood's End now and sort of understand um, some of these references that uh, are, are made in Xenogears. So those were three really big inspirations. Um, and if you want to learn more about what Takahashi was thinking as he was developing the story, uh, these are three sources you can go to to really, like, get a sense of what he was reading when he was writing, you know, Xenogears and, and coming up with the ideas for Xenogears. So check those out if you have time. So another really big inspiration on uh, Xenogears is Gnosticism and especially the idea of the, the Demiurge. But the idea of the, the Demiurge is that it's like a lesser or an inferior god or a false god figure. Um, and in this story that's obviously going to be Deus maybe even partly Miang, right? Um, and not only are they seen as imperfect, but in many um, sects of Gnosticism and in different religions of Gnosticism, they're, they're seen as evil even. So basically this god though, this demiurge, this lesser god, creates the, the material world, right? And so Gnost people who conformed to those religions basically resisted the material world and, and looked more for um, enlightenment in the spiritual realm for the most part. That's kind of the idea behind Gnosticism. But um, one important thing to take from this as well is that uh, many different Gnostic schools sometimes identified the Demiurge as uh, Ariman, uh, El, Saklas, Samuel, Satan, um, and, and the last one here is important, Yahweh. Yahweh, which is uh, the god of the, the Old Testament, um, is seen as a, a demiurge. And it's, it's really interesting because that was actually the original name of Deus. They were going to call Deus Yahweh. And uh, the, uh, Richard Honeywood, who was translating the game in English, begged them not to name it Yahweh <laughs> because he felt they would be too offensive to Christian people, a large audience in America and, and in English-speaking countries. So um, they ended up changing. There's a funny story behind that um, where he he was, you know, speaking in Japanese to them, explaining this, but obviously he, he mispronounced a word that then was sort of a pun in Japanese and everyone laughed about it. But they ended up changing the name from Yahweh to Deus in response to his concerns about it offending people. But uh, it is interesting to see how influenced by Gnosticism the game was. They were even going to name the final boss, the, the god figure, the demiurge of Xenogears, Yahweh. So uh, look into that if you want to learn more about um, some of those inspirations. Um, and then we get into a lot of the psychoanalytic um, inspirations for Xenogears. Now, 
uh, psychoanalysis, and this is something that I kind of want to bring up because there's a lot of people who, who you know, in even some of the sources that you guys gave to me, they would say, oh, Zen Ogre is so great because it's inspired by real um, psychology. You know, there's a lot of real psychology we're seeing here. And while that's true in a sense, um, psychoanalysis is a branch of psychology. It's, it's not a very scientific branch. <laughs> um, psychoanalysis is more of a philosophical approach um, and, and not very much a scientific approach to understanding the human psyche. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Sigmund Freud was sort of the, the person who started this whole branch of psychology, psychoanalysis. And his ideas are what are, are more or less the base or foundation of um, psychoanalysis and it's been for the most part to, up to now even maybe even 20 30 years ago people really started to say uh, psychoanalysis is a pseudoscience it's it's not like the ideas are not based on on real scientific study they're just based on philosophical ideas of people who lived a long long time ago um, mostly in the early 1900s this movement started but in any in any case it's fascinating stuff and and i think it's great for the story you know all the psychology that's put into like Faye with id and his multiple personalities and stuff like that like it's very interesting and it works really well for the story but to call it like real psychology i think is a little bit of a stretch but psychoanalysis was a big sort of shared interest for takahashi and his wife uh, Kaore Tanaka, who also worked at Square, by the way. Uh, they got married and they developed this story together. Um, and so you can see their inspirations, how they sort of came together, but they both really enjoyed the philosophy of a lot of these um, great thinkers uh, within psychoanalysis. People like Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud and Karen Horney and Jacques Lacan. And you can actually see uh, in the example of Jacques Lacan, they took his last name, Lacan, and turned him into one of their characters. So there's another direct reference there. Lacan is, it comes from Jacques Lacan. Um, Faye's mother, Karen, is very clearly a reference to Karen Horry, or Horry, Karen Horney, and her theory of neurosis. Um, if we look at uh, her theory of neurosis here, uh, I'll just kind of go read through this. Horney looked at neurosis in a different light from other psychoanalysts at the time. Her expansive interest in the subject led her to compile a detailed theory of neurosis. And here's the important part. Horney believed these stimuli to be less important except for influences during childhood. Rather, she placed significant emphasis on parental indifference towards the child, believing that the child's perception of events as opposed to the parent's intentions is the key to understanding a person's neurosis. For example, a child might feel a lack of warmth and affection should a parent make fun of the child's feelings. The parent may also casually neglect to fulfill promises, which in turn would have a detrimental effect on the child's mental state. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more to this, but you can see that direct reference on Faye and his mother. The way that she was indifferent towards his pain and suffering, the fact that she actually inflicted some of that on him, the fact that his father would leave and go away for a long time and, and neglect or ignore what was going on there and fail to see that uh, Karen had essentially been replaced by Miang. But the fact that his mother's name is Karen, I think, is a direct reference to this idea, her theory of neurosis, and specifically that part of it, that the way a parent treats a child and the child's perception of those um, the, the meaning behind what those um, actions meant uh, shaped a child's psychology. And then you get into the part where the personality splits and you have Sigmund Freud's idea of the id, um, which is where the character id comes from. So there's tons and tons and tons of references to a lot of these people and uh, their, their theories and their thoughts and their philosophy on human psychology. So, um, very, very fascinating stuff. Again, really cool and works great in a fictional work like this. But I think, it, I think it's a big stretch to call uh, Xenogears inspired by real psychology. Um, I've heard a couple of other people online and different sources saying this, and I don't agree with that. But I do think it's fascinating stuff, so I really like it.
Okay, um, beyond that, the other th there's just a couple more things I want to talk about. And the first one is music. Um, you know, a lot of people agreed with what I said in my last video about the music. How um, it's too repetitive, there's not enough of it. There are some of you who are adamant that they, they really, really love the music. And so, um, as I've been working throughout the day, just with headphones on, uh, when I'm in my car traveling, when it just basically I've been listening to the Xenogear soundtrack over and over and over again. And from just a listener's standpoint, from not from how it's used in the game, because my criticism still stands there, but just from a listening standpoint, it's really, really good. I really love it. Um, I, I like to listen to it while I write as well. Um, and I think that it, it creates this really, really amazing, unique atmosphere, and it evokes emotion for me. So I just want to you know, add to my previous criticisms this praise of it, that the music itself, what is there, is just really, really good. It's really subtle, it's emotional, it's powerful, it's impactful, it's it's wonderful music, and I love the soundtrack to death. Um, so many just unbelievably good tracks on it. I just wish there was more, so that for such a huge game with so many different uh, things going on, there could be some more appropriate pieces to supplement some of those things without all of the repetition. But the music itself is amazing, and um, I'm starting to like it so much now that it's it's rival rivaling Chrono Trigger in my mind, just from a listening standpoint, not again from how it's used in, in you know throughout the game and stuff. But I just wanted to throw that out there. I wanted to let you guys know that I really like the soundtrack. Um, and uh, another thing I wanted to add is, despite the game's problems, because it has a lot, and we've discussed what those are both in the last video and in a, a few questions I have about the story in this one, despite any flaw that might exist or any um, inconsistency, the fact that the game inspired me to look into this, to this level, to this extent, to go this um, crazy in depth, in terms of researching the game, the fact that I was motivated to do that, I wanted to learn more, is a testament to, I think, how powerful the game is and how much of an impact it had on me emotionally. And that means a lot. That really means a lot, despite the logical leaps or any inconsistencies in the story or, or any of the flaws in the translation, um, weird wording, or even with music being you know, too repetitive, despite the game feeling incomplete in many, many ways, it was still so impactful that it has inspired me to just continue thinking about it and discussing it with you guys and looking into it and trying to understand the mind of the director and the writers. And, and that speaks volumes about how fascinating the story of this game really is. And so I want to give huge props to the creators um, of the game and everyone who worked on it. They did a very, very good job despite their limitations and despite the fact that they couldn't really complete the game. I would love, I would love to see this game remade. Of all games I have ever played, this is the one I want to see remade and actually given the time and attention it needs to be completed. Um, I would love to see that way more than I would love to see a remake of Final Fantasy VII, and I love Final Fantasy VII. It's one of my favorite games of all time, but I would much rather see this game remade. It needs it way, way more, in my opinion. Okay, let's uh, move on to some of your um, comments and see if I can uh, reply to some of them. I'm not going to be able to reply to everybody, but there are a few um, in particular that I'd really like to respond to. Uh, we got Joshua Treat here. This part of his comment. This piece is extraordinarily human. Um, and he goes on to, uh, to talk about how it's a, it's a kind of storytelling that engages us. That I agree with. That's kind of the heart and soul of Xenogears. Um, and, and, and you see that in the philosophy between um, Corellian and Fey at the very end of the game, um, when Corellian has sort of become one with Deus already, and, and Fey is saying, like, no, um, humanity isn't perfect. We're, we're not. We're flawed. But I believe that we can continue to work to overcome these things. He, it, it, his perspective is that that imperfection, part of what makes us human, 
is a part that he loves, and um, it, that's kind of in direct opposition to Corellian's idea, which is humanity is imperfect, therefore it needs to be transformed into to something greater by becoming one with Deus. And the imperfections, which is kind of what he's talking about here, are what th that sort of philosophy is sort of what makes the game so human. And, and I really agree with that. I think that's a really great point. Okay, so then we have this comment by Radical Dreamer, and there's a couple of sections in particular I want to focus on. It says, uh, here, it's incredibly difficult to find video games like this um, today, especially these days. And he goes on to admit he he knows he understands the game's rough and that it's, it's a bit rushed and incomplete. But despite all of this, um, he says here, it generally stays with you. And that he, he sort of misses... Um, the engagement he used to find uh, with with fans and, and fan-made creations based around it. He, he can't really find a lot of fanfics or, or you know, he feels that people have moved on to, from it, but that during the time that it was released that it was uh, a gold mine for creative people. All of this I agree with you 100% on. I think this game has inspired me as a creator just immensely. Like, And, and it is a very dense game. He goes on to, or at least up here, was sort of comparing it with uh, Xenoblade. Um, the differences between Xenogears and Xenoblade. Xenoblade was made much simpler in its storytelling. And I think for that reason, it was much more well-received, felt more complete. It wasn't nearly as ambitious from a storytelling point of view as this was. And he sort of laments that. Um, but I, I guess, in, in my opinion, I think that's the right move because... To me, I'd rather have a game that feels complete than than a game that feels incomplete, even though it makes it stays with me and everything. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I like Xenoblade more than Xenogears, even though Xenogears has made me think more, even though Xenogears has led me to do more research, even though Xenogears um, tells a more human story, has much more uh, layered characters, um, like all of that would be would elevate it to being probably the greatest game ever if it were a complete work <laughs> and the fact that it is so incomplete and that some of the presentation is so wretched and that it doesn't really come all that close to reaching its potential i think to me is um it just feels like a, a massive shame like i just it 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 grinds me inside like oh i really wish that this had been uh, given an opportunity, which is why I want it to be remade, but given an opportunity to, to be what it was meant to be, what it was envisioned to be. And Zeno, Xenoblade Chronicles is that. It does achieve that. It achieves what it was what it was envisioned to be. And Xenogears does not. And the, depending on the type of person you are, you're obviously the type of person that can look past those imperfections and see what it was meant to be and, and really um, appreciate that. And I appreciate it as well, but I want to I want to experience it in its completed form. And I find this almost disconnect for me, this just annoying, nagging feeling like this game didn't get there and I, I just really want to experience that. And so for that reason, Xenogears um, for me falls under Xenoblade. But, uh, but I understand your point of view and I wanted to acknowledge that. Then we have... Uh, I don't know how I'm gonna. I don't know if I'll ever pronounce this correctly. Serenade, serenade silhouette, sil silhouette, serenade silhouette, something like that. I agree in the game. I agree that the game was much too ambitious for their budget and time period. However, that's part of what made the game so endearing to fans. Part of what makes good RPG makes a good RPG is how expansive the universe feels, and literally any part of the six episode timeline can be used to make a fulfilling game in its own right. Much of the development of the team for Xenogears left to create their own company, Monolith Soft, uh, yeah, which is true, um, which went on to develop Xenosaga and the Xenoblade games. Um, while playing the game, it's a bit dissatisfying that a lot of the story elements are rushed. Well, he says a bit rushed. I, I think that that's a stretch. I think it's very rushed. <laughs> the the, the, the um, presentation on disc 2 is not a bit rushed, in my opinion. It's very, very rushed and very poorly executed. But I think that's just a difference of opinion there. It has, an incredible it has incredible story elements and leaves a lot open to the imagination. This is true. 
Everything you're saying is true. And I think there are going to be some people who are on, on your side who are, where the ideas are just so fascinating that and so uh, enlightening and, and just eye-opening to a, a, per, a creative mind that that's enough to fulfill you, to satisfy you. I'm not one of those people. I need the ideas to be great, which they are, and they do enlighten me and they, they are eye-opening for me. All the same things, I feel all the same things, but there is still the disconnect in execution. To me, execution is very important. I want to be able to experience all those ideas, not just as ideas that I read about in a summary, not just ideas that I read about in, in your comments and in discussion, but one that I can experience in the form of the game itself. That's what I want to experience. That's what I want to have. I want to be able to lose myself, step away from my analytical mind, and be able to just be in there in the moment with the characters without any disruptions, without any interruptions to that, without me having to say, okay, brush past this issue or this flaw, and just think about it at, at its base level of the idea. Isn't that idea cool? Yes, it's great. It's a, it's a wonderful idea. But I don't get to experience it as part of a larger, uh, complete, well-executed story. And that's the problem that I have with Xenogears. And yes, the ideas are so fascinating that many people are able to look past that. But I can't look past that. That's, all, that's, that's really all there is to it. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, a bunch of people brought up the fact that I didn't mention Billy in the last episode. So let me just say, really quick, yes, I, I, I don't know how I forgot to mention Billy. <laughs> but Billy's a great character. I love Billy. And I didn't think I'd like him very much at first. I think his design and especially his attitude were really grating to me. It's like, ah, I don't like people like this. I don't like him. But um, over time... Uh, and especially when you, you saw him wheeling the guns, you got this kind of like dualistic sort of character uh, where Josiah taught him how to use guns and, and, and you know, he has these this really cool ability to wield weapons and, and everything, but that's like in total opposition to his appearance as like a cleric, uh, you know. And so there's this like dualistic nature to the character that I found really cool. And so I like Billy a lot as a character. We got J Cross here. Um, and he he takes issue and there's actually a couple people uh, RPG mr. RPG crazy who's down here Actually, you can't see that right here have taken issue to some of my criticisms of Faye uh, Talking about how I think he's kind of a dumb character and everything like that and so I've heard I've heard what you're saying here um, In this comment chain. I've, I've read everything and I see where you guys are coming from and I, I will um, admit that it is true that I um, Faye being this imperfect character, this weak character, um, a, a, a flawed character, is indeed a, a very powerful thing, and that he does go through a lot and becomes um, a very much more complete character by the end. His arc, the character development they do with Faye, is actually really quite phenomenal. Totally agree with that. Uh, I've, I've shifted my feelings about him a little bit. I don't dislike Faye necessarily. Um, again, sorry, I touched the mic there, uh, talking about the, the, this re redemption of the character by the end of it, uh, because he's so flawed, like, I, I see where you're coming from, and I agree with you. However, um, there are still just some, some parts, and, and I, I, I'm playing the game again through with my girlfriend, uh, we're on Twitch, by the way, playing it every now and then, um, I'll put a link to my Twitch channel in the, in the, description below but playing through it again there were a couple of things that just made me go like oh my goodness like it's so strange the way that he reacts to people it just makes him sound kind of dumb and i'll put a few of those here on screen from the early game Doc, some flying archers went toward lawn so we saw them too judging by their shadows they appear to be a group of gears from our neighbor country in kislev those were Gears? Holy crap. Oh no, they're headed directly for Lon! The ones I just saw? No, you idiot! The ones you didn't see! Of course those ones! Let us make haste! Right! Wait, is this the guy that you said was kind of stupid? Yeah. Faye's kind of dumb. 
But one part that really solidified this idea for me was that there's some bird seed at Sitan's house. And, you know, she's running around, she's, she goes to interact with it, and there's some chickens running around uh, his, his property. And I figure, oh, he'll grab the bird seed and, and he'll throw some at the chickens. But, but by clicking on the bird seed, Faye eats it. And he's poisoning himself. You actually lose HP. You can continually eat this bird seed and his health goes down. And from what I heard, he can die. I found bird seed! I bet you didn't do that, Michael. Tried a little bit, but it didn't taste very good. Wait, I want to give it to the birds. You what? ate that bird seed a bunch of times, and it took your health down from 30 to 9. No, it didn't! Yes, it did. Oh my gosh, what? I was about to die? Yep. <gasps> and it's just like, who in their right mind would imagine, oh, there's some bird seed there, and there are chickens running around. I'm going to go up there and eat this bird seed. That's not the thought anybody has. They go up there, oh, I'll, I'll spread some of this bird seed out for the birds to eat. But Faye eats the bird seed and continues to do so if you click on it until he dies. It's just like, what the fetch? And I don't know, there's just, there, there's a lot of the way he responds to people. He, he seems very confused a lot of the time. And I'll get into this here in just a minute. Uh, because there was a very good point that was brought up. I want to make sure that I find it. It's a pretty cool talking point. Another look at the game as a fresh perspective as an adult. I've gone back and replayed Xenogears a couple times. Uh, preconceived ideas. Love your open-minded discussion. Okay, down here he says, Regarding the thing with Faye repeating things, I believe it's something that doesn't translate well into English. It's not that the words themselves can't be translated, but the conversation etiquette within the culture. Basically, one would repeat something to have someone elaborate or continue the conversation on that particular point. For example, it's also, or for example, it's also a form of affirmation to the speaker that you are paying attention, similar to hi hi hi, which is yes in Japanese. Um, so I asked Landon about this, and uh, Landon actually explained that this is very common, and it's called. This is the actual term for it, and I'll put it up here for you guys to see. Aizuchi. A Japanese term for frequent interjections during conversation that indicate the listener is paying attention and or understanding the speaker. Uh, speaker. In linguistic terms, these are a form of phatic expression. So, um, in essence, uh, Landon was also telling me that um, he, when he lived in Jap Japan for a couple years and came back, he had a, a girlfriend who kind of got annoyed by his interjections and saying like, oh yeah, is that right? Or um, she would say something and he would repeat what she said in the form of a question. I don't know, let's just make it up. Um, hey, I went to the store today. Oh, you went to the store today? You know, um, repeating what they said in the form of a question. Now, in, in the culture, that's uh, a way of affirming that you're listening. But we don't really do that here. So she's like, why do you always repeat what I say? So I found that very interesting. Um, so uh, that's kind of a cultural thing that didn't translate very well into English. Um, again, Richard Honeywood had a hell of a time trying to get this game completed uh, by himself, translating such a huge thing. But that's just one of the things that doesn't really translate necessarily, but it is not a sign that Faye is dumb. But there are other things that kind of still lead me to feel that way about him. But again, I feel like he's an incomplete person. He's, he's a young, newly formed personality at the beginning of the game. Very naive in a lot of ways. But when he brings all of his personalities together and his, his uh, memories are reformed he he becomes much more complete person and i like him a lot more there or towards the end of the game there's a redemption that comes along with that right but in any case um i i understand where you guys are coming from and i agree with you now here's a here's a big one i don't have time to go into this right now mr rpg crazy um now that i've done these videos if you want to have a, a chat on discord Follow us in Discord, I can, we can talk to you about stuff, but I, I just don't have time right now to go into all that. Uh, there are a lot of great comments, and I apologize that I can't get to all of them. Um, I really wish that I could, but I can't. Um, if there is something you wanted me to address, um, I'll try to be a little bit better about responding to as many of you as possible in the comments this time. Because last time I was like, oh, that's a great comment, I'll just kind of save that for my next discussion video, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to get into all those comments, so... Um, if there's something you wanted to talk to me about that I haven't addressed yet, leave a comment, 
and I will make sure to jump in there and discuss it with you in uh, in the comments section. Whew, that is a long video. Thank you for hanging in there with me, but I think I'm ready now to uh, do my review on Xenogears. So I'm going to jump headlong into that this week. I'm going to be writing it, um, recording it, and start editing. And um, let me know what you guys think about everything I've talked about. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. I have nothing else to say. I'm kind of tired of talking at this point. I've been talking so much. But you guys are beasts, and if you have not joined our Discord server yet, please do so. The link is in the description. We have tons of really great conversations going on all the time. They're like forums, basically, with lots of different topics. So, you know, join the Discord server, talk to us, uh, and to all the other people. We have a great community there. We'd love to see you guys there. And um, if you want to follow us on Twitch, we do live streaming on the weekends. Uh, those links are going to be in the description as well. Look forward to some more Xenogears discussion in the comment section. And I can't wait to finally get this review out for you guys. So it's, it's coming. It's coming soon. All right. Peace out, everybody.